So rather than let it float, they sunk it. Yeah, and did you see her go down? No, I didn't. You were below decks again. No, I. <laughs> no, when when I went down the next day, uh, the next day I was transferred to uh, Northampton, across the water and with the buoy, you know, the lifeline. Sure. And I stayed on uh, Northampton. It took us into New New Caledonia, which was right off of uh, Australia. And we stayed in camps, tents in uh, New Caledonia for three weeks while we were getting our new equipment and sh shoes and stuff and uh, until they could find where we were going. And some some of us had to stay out there and were assigned to ships and out there and different things. But I was lucky with 600 others came back to San Diego and received 26 days survivor's leave and then orders to go to Boston to the Lexington. So you get back to San Diego in one piece yeah. And because you're a survivor, you get 26 days leave. Yeah, survivor's leave. And what and what did you do with that 26 days? I went up into the UP of Michigan <laughs> in December <laughs> and almost froze to death. <laughs> and and then then I, I left there and I took the train and I went to Boston to the Fargo building. And that was to Lexington. And so that was the New Year's. Of 1943, when I met my future wife for the first time on New Year's Eve. So New Year's Eve, she was there. She was there, and I knew her grandmother and her aunt and cousin three years before that. Mm. You said you served with her cousin. Yeah, I served on the first ship with her cousin. On the, on the Helena. Yeah, on the Helena. Yeah. And I had my first lobster with her grandmother at... Uh, the blacksmith shop on Route 9 in Wellesley. Mm -hmm. And I got a card at that blacksmith shop. There's no more blacksmith shop no, there. I'm sure it's long gone. It's, but I mean, uh, it was a famous place mm. for lobsters and steaks at Route 9. And that was on June 15th, believe it or not, 1940. And I got married on June 15th, 1943. Exactly. Three, three years, years later. Right. So I remember that lobster. Wow. <laughs> but I mean, uh, that, that's why it's, it's interesting how I ended up in Massachusetts. Sure. You know what I mean? And uh, like I say, she was a beautiful girl. Mm. And you told me an interesting story about your wife and, and trips back and forth that she made to connect with you while you were in the Navy. And tell us about uh, that. Oh, the. the the time you mean we left Boston Harbor? Sure. Uh, well, that's unusual to leave a uh, port on a Sunday or a holiday. Mm -hmm. And it happened on the Lexington when we left Boston Harbor July 4th on a Sunday, 1943. Now, that's unusual to leave port on a holiday. Sure especially during the war mm -hmm. on July 4th, 1943. Mm -hmm. And when we got the, out of the harbor, we scraped bottom going out. We got orders to go to Newport News, Virginia, into dry dock. Mm -hmm. And when I was able to get the phone, I decided to call Boston and just talk to my wife. Right. Tell her what happened, uh, why we were on our way to the canal. Right. And I got no answer. So while I was at a phone, I said, well, I'll call my oldest sister in Owasso, Michigan. Uh -huh. So I call my oldest sister, and who answers the phone but my wife. What a coincidence. She had already taken a train from Boston to visit my family in Michigan. Sure. And I talked to her, and I told her what happened. Right. And two days later, I got the surprise. What I got a, I got a call from the guard at the Navy Yard entrance saying my wife was at the gate. Could I come meet her? So she travels pretty quickly. <laughs> and not only that, we didn't have money in those days either, you mm -hmm. know. And mm -hmm. it, it was still expensive to travel regardless. Sure. 
And I don't know where she got the money. Probably my sister gave it to her. Uh -huh. <laughs> but we had to find a place that night when she got there. Sure. And not only that, we didn't have a lot of money at the time. Mm. I was only a second, no, I was first class electrician. But the $96 a month, uh, sure. you don't go far on And that. she wasn't allowed to stay on the base. No, she couldn't. St we sure. were, I was on the ship. We, we didn't have the base. We still lived on the ship right. in the dry dock. Did you, have to get, did you have to get special permission to, to leave the ship and to spend some time with her? No, I had, I had liberty every day. Every day? Every day at 4 o'clock, and I, I'd come back in the morning. So what, so what were the circumstances that you, you earned liberty every day? Was that something that you had exclusively well, or everybody uh, on, on board had? No, you, you had probably three out of four days, but it, was, it wasn't hard in Norfolk to get the fourth day. Mm -hmm. Somebody stand by for you. Right. So I had every night liberty, and that lasted for another, another 10 days, I think. Really? Which was unusual. And I could never tell her I was leaving, and she never knew when the ship would leave. So she went to work as a hairdresser on a 50-50 basis to get enough money to, you know, to live on. Sure. <coughs> and I couldn't tell her we're leaving. But she found out when she saw the ship out in the harbor, anchored. Mm -hmm. She says, uh-oh, the ship is gone. She knew then. And we, while we were anchored out there, they demagnetize the ship when it leaves the shipyard. Yeah. So there's no magnetism. Right. And they call it degaussing. Right. It's it's a process. And then when she saw the ship leave the next day. She knew. She knew. And, but she had to work to get enough money to go back home. Mm. And uh, she worked as a hairdresser and 50-50 because she was good. Mm. And that concludes part two of our amazing interview with Mr. Alan Josie. Please join us again for the third part. I'm Bob DeToma, and remember, we're all living history right now.